What's going on guys? It's Brian and Jack DeMeo. We're back with another hot and cold list this week. We missed last week. I was on vacation. Jack was hunting footage at Heroes Con, but we are back with another hot and cold list. How you doing, Jack? Man, doing well. Glad to be back. We're sorry to have missed you guys a week, but you know what? Brian's got to take some time off sometime. And like Brian said, I was busy at Heroes Con, but we are back here again with another hot and cold list for you straight from the contributors of CBSI. Right. And just breaking up the contributors, we're going to bring up the contributors of this list. This week, we do have some more MIA. I was on vacation, so I can't complain when other people take vacations. So we got Ben Steiniger and Topher S enjoying some rest and relaxation. But everyone else is here with great hot and cold picks. And with that being said, we are going to roll right into the hot and cold list this week, starting with the hot picks. And first up, we have Indy Spotlight writer himself, Andy Tomberlin. Hey, what's up, CBSI Nation? Andy here with uh, Indy Spotlight Series on comicbookinvest.com. What's hot this week? I got to go with Shannon Mayer Art. He's blowing up. Uh, he blew up on dark red on some of the variants there that were going for over $200. And since then, it's just been fire, fire, fire. Uh, right now, he's doing some uh, variants, the Vampirella variant that's going for over $40. Uh, there's a red Sonya Birth of She Devil variant that's going for over $100. There's a Lady Death Merciless uh, that's going for around $65. Right now he's hot. He's new, uh, a painter. Um, seems to be the the, the trend uh, to find these new artists, and and they, and they heat up like that. So definitely one to watch out for. Anything Shannon Mayer art right now is a pretty good pickup uh, if you can find it cheap, and uh, will flip flip really well on uh, eBay. Uh, check out the stores that are selling the variants, and then maybe uh, look at the eBay sales, and and you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, but that's hot this week. Jack. What do you think of Andy's pick? Well, he, I think he's spot on. We've seen Shannon Mayer on the CBSI Hot 10 list in the past. So without a doubt, Shannon Mayer has begun to make a mark on the scene and in the hobby. Um, I think a lot of this comes from the production of retailer exclusive variants. Brian, you and I have been intricately involved in the production of these variants. And when you start looking at the economics of it, one of the largest expenses is the commissioning of the art. And kind of the go-to for a long time for a lot of retailers would be to reach out to some of these higher-end A-list artists, some of your Adam Hughes, your Art Germ, your uh, J. Scott Campbell. But what we're seeing more and more is these artists are taking themselves off the table and starting their own programs. And what that's doing is that's leaving kind of companies scrambling, looking for that next big artist. And we've seen some of these artists, especially these painted style artists, kind of rise in popularity. We're going to talk about a couple other artists on this list as well um, who kind of fit into that category. And Shannon Mayer really is the antithesis of this because his success has really been born from these retailer exclusive variants. He was a, a relatively unknown when that original book popped off. And now he's got some serious momentum. Uh, to play devil's advocate, I'd say I didn't love his Harley Quinn depiction for Deceased that did really well, but I didn't love that, that kind of short arm that... Uh, had going on but other than that i would say that these covers have definitely um made an impact um i'd like to see how he does doing some male characters as well as just doing the female characters because it seems real easy to make a mark in the hobby doing these kind of like voluptuous beauty female covers um it's a lot more difficult to, to create like a wolverine cover that makes a mark in the industry um so that would be my next challenge to him but definitely killing it definitely hot without a doubt and you should pay attention if you see a solicitation for a variant for shannon mayor because there's a good chance it will go over its original asking price i've always seen the art i've always enjoyed the art but i'm i haven't personally picked up any of the books yet part of it's because i'm complacent or too late and then when they come out they it is hot and i have seen the prices rise and then i definitely hands off because i'm not gonna chase i don't it's hard enough to chase incentive variants. I don't like chasing store variants. So no, great yeah, art. If you did, go ahead. Yeah, if you didn't get them at the initial offering, it's kind of I don't. I've ne I don't think I've ever purchased one on the secondary market, um, other than for myself for the PC. I've never purchased one to try to resale on the secondary market. If you can't get it on that initial offering for that initial price, you definitely need to let it go. All right. But yes, and it. I mean, I do love the art. So kudos to that, and I think that's a great pick. So. Thank you, Andy, for that pick this week. 
And rolling right along, we're going to go into the next pick, and that is from Run the Table author, Clint Jocelyn. Good morning, CBSI Nation. Clint Jocelyn coming to you with my hot pick of the week. And my hot pick of the week this week is Transformers Comics and Transformers Variants. With the release of the John Gallagher books, you're seeing an uptake within these, those books as well as others too. There's always been a strong underground following for these books. And I think that anytime one warms up, the rest of them start to warm up. And you can see that in the sales and you can see that within the marketplace. Also with the release of the Constructicons crossover coming, that's going to add more juice to this. So my pick of the week is Transformers, anything to do with those comics. And again, these are safe bets. If you can pick up some of these ratios that cover or ratio cost, they're really good investments. There's always going to be a marketplace for them. They're never going to go out of style, and they're just going to become more increasingly harder to find. So my hot pick of the week this week, Transformers. Go find them in your bins if you can. Pick up that John Gallagher set, regardless of what others say. Those five issues are amazing. Clint Jocelyn, roll out. So looks like he's on vacation. I think I heard some caca, but caca back there. <laughs> But I like this pick. I'm sure you like this pick, because especially with an IDW right. as you are. But he makes a lot of good points. Um, a lot of those brands have been going up. Anytime there was a Transformers that had a 1 in 50, I definitely picked those up, especially like that Paul Pope Optimus Prime that came out a few years ago. But what do you think of his pick, Jack? Well, you said it. I love this pick. This is a pick that I think... Um, is spot on the market, but that a lot of speculators uh, don't have the stomach to pick. You know, it's not the um, the popular trendy pick on Instagram or on Twitter, but the reality of the situation is he's spot on. These Gallagher variants have made a mark in the hobby. People love that artwork. Now, I'd be remiss if we're going to talk about these Gallagher variants. Let's talk about them. Um, there was a piece that Rich Johnson put out on leadingcool.com that kind of uh, did what Rich Johnson tends to do and expose some kind of art shortcuts. Um, does it look like Gallagher copied poses from action figure cards, from promotional materials? Absolutely. I think you, you're lying to yourself to think that he didn't. Um, but we've had this debate on this channel before of is, is there something inherently wrong with that or not? Um, and I think the jury's still out. And I'm going to leave that up to Simpleman's Comics family. Let us know in the comments section how you feel about that. But beyond it, you cannot deny the stunning nature of these covers. And even if he did kind of copy uh, the poses, he definitely put his own spin on it. Um, as soon as these covers came out, Brian and I were messaging them to each other, talking about them. They're, they're absolutely outstanding. The point that I like that Clint made better, because I'm not, a, I'm not as big on the retailer exclusive variants for speculation as much as I am. The incentives is the fact that he's got speculators talking about Transformers. I talk about Transformers on the show saying play in a smaller pond because less people are talking about it, but those diehard fans exist, like Clint po pointed out. But what's happening now is as people are starting to make some money on these Transformers books, they start to say to themselves, well, what other Transformers books are out there that I could be making money on? And there's a ton. There's so many incentive variants that have just dried up beyond belief. Also, I'm, I've made this comment on this channel a few times. If you haven't seen Bumblebee, watch it. It's a good movie. It's definitely aimed towards a younger crowd, but it shows you what this new AllSpark Productions, Hasbro's independent movie company, has the capability of doing. And I have faith in them and their future uh, movie uh, rollouts, to quote uh, a Transformers term. And... Um, and I think that uh, the Hasbro universe has a lot of positivity going for it. And watch out for those future Power Rangers movies on Hasbro as well. Hasbro now owns that property. But um, so I'm bullish on everything uh, Power Rangers. Well, I am bullish on Power Rangers. But I'm bullish on everything Transformers right now. I think they've got a movie slate on the way. I think that there are so many books that haven't gotten the spotlight yet. So I agree with Clint. Keep an eye out on those bins. If you see gorgeous cover art from an incentive and you don't see it available on eBay, buy it because you can name your price and you may have to wait a little while, but you're going to find a buyer. It's happened time and time again. Right. And one thing I'll add to that, especially with this time of year, when you're hitting those cons, start checking those two, those one, two, five dollar boxes. A lot of times you'll see transformer variants in those boxes for cheap and you can pick them up and then you'll make money on them later. I did it at Baltimore last year. On Sunday, the last day, the guy had a bunch of 
all types of incentive variants, and he's like, hey, I'm trying to get rid of them, $1 a piece. So I was sitting there stacking, pulling transformer variants. If it had RI next to it, man, I was pulling it either right. way. Some of them I picked up from a personal collection, and then some I turned around and flipped, but definitely enjoy transformers. And we also have that Ghostbuster transformer coming out this what the, today came out today, right? Yeah, came, came out today. Came and right now, if you go to comicbookinvest.com, the variant heat check, the top book on the variant heat check is the Sony exclusive version of that book. So you know these books are making uh, uh, waves in the hobby. Toy collectors are already talking about that Transformers, Ghostbusters, um, the vehicle coming out. So um, you know. These things are starting to really make their mark. And Brian also made a great point about those cons because whenever you look at those discount variant boxes, I always see heavy IDW variants in there. Um, you have to really know how to market those as a retailer to be able to sell those. And a convention where people kind of come in for like, you know, a little bit of everything isn't always the best place for that. So those are great stealth buys. That's a great point for Brian because it is con season. Yeah. So another great pick by Clint. And we're going to keep rolling right along. And our next pick comes from the Reading Pile author, Dan Piercy. Hey guys, this is Dan Piercy with T. Piercy's Comics, which forwards some article on CBSI, The Reading Pile. My hot pick this week is going to be Image Comics. I think they are reaching a particular standard of excellence that they haven't attained before. I think a lot of these books are future options and will be $20 and $25 raw flips. Um, books like Monstrous, Sonata, uh, Gogar, and Criminal. I read all of these this weekend for a uh, upcoming Ring Pile article and they are just excellent, excellent reads. Very impressed with them. Um, there's also stuff like Little Bird and Thumbs and this one that are critically acclaimed and I think substantiate my pick for Image Comics being a hot pick this week. See ya. Right on. So, you know what this is? This is, a, this is my Little Bird. Do you want to see Big Bird? <laughs> So, there we have Dan's pick. He's talking Image Comics. I like Dan's pick more from, well, where he comes from. He writes The Reading Pile. I think Image, outside of superhero stories, I love Image books for all the other stories that they write. A lot of their titles I like. The thing is, is Image puts out a bunch. I mean, it's creator-owned, so there's always a lot of books. So some you get passed over that are probably good stories, but then some are... Uh, stories that that aren't very good, but there's always enough there where all the titles he mentioned are all titles I like as well. I love Criminal, um, Little Bird. I enjoyed. I had to read the first issue a couple times to to like really uh, soak it in. But you never and thing with Image, which happened to me back in what 2011, 2012. Every Image title that came out, I was picking up because <coughs> they were all getting hot. Peter Panzerfaust, all those other books. Um, so there was a time where Ghosted, Five Ghosts, um, Todd the Ugliest Kid, all those image books, the number ones came out, I was picking them up, and they were hot on the secondary market. So you never know what image books are going to do, and then I'll let you, Jack, tell me what you think about Dan's pick. Well, I agree. Um, Dan's pick, <clears throat> again, you pointed out, comes from the reading perspective, and without a doubt, I think for most of us... Um, you read enough comics image tends to be people's kind of go to outside of the superhero universe myself when i got back into comics for you know my second stint i jumped in with like southern bastards and nail biter were two of my first reads when i i kind of realized if i want to speculate i got to get harder into reading and those were kind of my first two books i picked up and read and both of those books i'm still bullish on an adaptation for although it's taken some time and I think the difference with where he's saying they're hot now versus then, I don't necessarily think that the quality is better of these books now versus then. I just think, and again, you and I talk about this all the time on the Bolo Show, we live in the age of optioning. So options are just happening fast and furious right now. And you're seeing books come out. Um, we, you know, And even ones, great books like Deadly Class that come out, got a show. I loved that show, season one. And now we know it's not returning, which is unfortunate. And it was just more of, a, I think, indicative of being on sci-fi versus being um, on a different network. Uh, but 
what that allows us as speculators to do is almost every book that comes out on image is in play at some point. And it's all about the timing of it because you've got books like Southern Bastards and Nailbite are two books that were optioned a while ago that have now been kind of quiet and are almost dead on the market, but they're one piece of news away from coming right back in play. And all of these new books that are coming out that we're seeing like die um, and uh, um, like you mentioned, little bird and books like that, as soon as they release, it's almost like there's option books. People are talking about it. And that's what you're going to get from creator owned because the big two, they've already got this entire movie faction going on with Warner brothers and with Disney and every other company is scrambling to get in on this uh, comic book movie kind of um, renaissance that we're in right now in Hollywood. So you see it with the Netflix uh, deal with Dark Horse. Um, you're seeing it with Sony and Valiant. And I think we're going to see it even more with these independent books because they have the freedom to go wherever they want. Image isn't signing one deal with one company. They're allowing these creators to go out and pitch their product to different places. And um, that makes image books very attractive. I almost feel like any image number one uh, that comes out has an opportunity to be optioned. And any time a book is getting optioned, you can almost guarantee that at, at least for a period of time, it's going to go above cover price. And it's all about the timing. You, Brian and I talked just a couple weeks ago about the spec cycle of you know when you're trying to unload these books, which is really the key if you're playing the image game. Because as Brian mentioned, there was a time when we were grabbing up every image book and stocking them, just thinking we were going to get rich off of it. And then we all got stuck with short boxes full of indie books that are great reads, but we're not going to be able to do anything with them until some sort of new news. And I just think Hollywood has got their finger on the pulse with some of these new books more than they are going back to books from five years ago. So I do think that you have a better chance with a book that's releasing today than a book that released five years ago where every movie studio has kind of already had the chance to preview it and see how they felt about it. So definitely be on the lookout for future image releases. But I don't want to go and say that every image book is hot because we're certainly going to talk about plenty of image books that hit the cold list. Right. Then there was even some books that are optioned before they come out, like Kirkman's Outcast. And I think that hurt the book ultimately because it caused like a, what, a 70,000 print run for issue number one. And with that and it being on, what was it, Showtime? <laughs> yeah. And after the first season, it was released over in, I think, England on Fox. And then it was released on Showtime here. And they were working out. I think Showtime was reorganizing their channel lineup for their schedule. And it kind of hurt that show. But I enjoyed the show and I enjoyed the book. But, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good pick. It's a good solid pick. And it's on the hot list this week. Definitely. And, yeah, you mentioned Southern Bastards. I love Southern Bastards. One of my favorites. And, and to update that, I was just at Heroes Con. Um, I've developed a relationship with Jason Latour. Shout out to Jason. Um, he has been a big part of kind of motivating me throughout my comics career. And I ask him all the time, what's up with Southern Bastards? And he keeps telling me FX is still picking up the option. FX hasn't let that option go. They're not letting it go. Um, they're, they're kind of, they've been reorganizing their company and they wanted more Southern Bastards material. So Jason had to take time off from Southern Bastards to work on some of the stuff with Into the Spider-Verse and things like that that you saw. There is more Southern Bastards coming from him and Jason Aaron after War of Realms. And also, be on the lookout, and it's a good stealth buy to grab those Southern Bastards um, number ones because that, I do believe that show is coming. It's just a matter of time. And also, I'll tell you, because I love Southern Bastards, buy Southern Bastards too. Southern Bastards 2 is the first appearance of the guy who's probably going to be the biggest yeah. character in the show, Coach Boss. And Southern Bastards 2 is literally a below cover price book. I still buy that book out of dollar bins. I just don't think people realize it. And Coach Boss, if that show, when that, when that show gets made, excuse me, when that show gets made, um, Coach Boss will be by far the biggest character on that show and, and the most polarizing. So grab that issue number two because I don't think anybody even realizes it. Right. And speaking of Talking earlier how some store variants climb in price. Southern Bastards number one had that jetpack for Forbidden Planet variant, like the dark cover with the dog on it. Right. <clears throat> and then uh, Third Eye Comics had a store variant for it as well. That was really cool. And I, I got a couple of those. If I find those cheap, I pick them up as well. But yeah, love Southern and Bastards. Look out for that Heroes Con number one, yeah. uh, Southern Bastards number one, which is another one. Chris Hunter did the cover. And that book can frequently still hit $100. 
even with kind of that book being down a bit. Right. And um, Birthright was another book from Image that was optioned and it, it got hot for a little bit and it, it cooled off. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Birthright is a great example. I think we talked about Descender a yeah, couple weeks Descender. ago. Descender. It's optioned by Sony, but so all great picks. And uh, thank you, Dan, for that pick. And we're going to move right along now into the next hot pick this week. And it comes from Mel V from the Mighty Mel V YouTube channel. Yo, what up, TPS Live Nation? It's Mel V back with Hot Cold. Uh, my hot pick for this week will be Null. Um, Null made his return in Silver Surfer Black. And as you can see, all Null books are taking off. Um, hopefully, you got them for cheap because um, they're going to go up. Um, you know how things work in the comic world. There's a downswing in things, also upswing in things. So if there's another downswing with Null, I suggest you pick up Null books. You're only a downswing, but right now, he is hot as fire right now. So, Jack, kind of looked like Mel shrunk in that video. And, <laughs> and he looked like it was in a vacant office or like he's in the process of of moving out because <laughs> boiler, boiler room style you know we gotta make that quick move yeah. <laughs> there was nothing in there he got a go bag he's like this is my hot pick and i'm getting out of here <laughs> getting out of here but he picked Noel, right right what do you think about this pick because the character is all over the place right now and donny cates i mean could do no wrong right it honestly may be the most perfect pick for this list because it's topical right now no two weeks ago we were starting to see Venom number three from this current Donny Cates run starting to drop in price. And then something happened. And that something is Silver Surfer Black number one. Now, we didn't know Null's importance in that book. We knew there was a second print solicited for that book prior to the first print coming out. A lot of stores didn't order that second print because there was no cover art. We didn't even know the popularity of number one. And the belief was, why are they even coming out on a second print? There's a million store variants. It seems like Silver Surfer number one won't be a hard book to get. But Marvel had that surprise for us, and we get that cover with Null and Silver Surfer on the cover. And the next thing you know, everything Null is exploding. Because people realize now this is a character beyond just the Venom storyline, who now has importance with Silver Surfer and the, and the lore there. And it shows that really he could kind of go anywhere. Now again, this is just Donny Cates playing with his own toys. But Don, look at what Donny Cates is doing. He's also writing Guardians of the Galaxy. Now we brought in Null and Cosmic Sphere. Um, anything's possible. So we're seeing later prints of the uh, Venom number three um, starting to spike as well. We're seeing, again, that second print from Silver Surfer Black number one is doing like 15 to $20. So Null is definitely red hot right now. I'll be honest with you, as a speculator, I'm selling my Null right now. Not because I don't believe in the character, but because I can't turn down the prices that it's going for now in comparison to, say, three or four weeks ago. And I don't know whether this is a seasonal popularity or if this is a character that's really going to be here to stay. I think Noel is the one I'm selling right now. Dylan Brock is the one I'm buying right now from that run. But, you know, each his own. Uh, let us know in the comments section, Sibelman's Comic Family, how you feel about this Venom spec. But that's where I'm at with it. Right. And speaking of Venom, we're going to roll right into the next pick on the hot list. And it is from Cover Tunes. Before we go into it. I'm going to break right there for a second. Mike Morello, author of Cover Tunes, he was out there at HeroCons with you, and he had a fantastic interview with Jenny Friesen, right? Yeah, it was really great. I Actually, I was walking up to Jenny Friesen with my daughters. My daughters call her Wonder Woman. It was on Father's Day on Sunday. And all of a sudden, I look up, and who's standing in front of the table? Mike Morello. And I hadn't been able to link up with him while we were at Heroes Con. Everybody was running in different directions. And, um, and I was, like, literally all day, pitching Simple Men's Comics YouTube channel to every single creator I could. So when I saw him, I, I jumped on that opportunity, hooked him up with some microphones, made sure we got that uh, that interview the way we wanted it, and it came out great. It was exciting. It was fun to watch the report. He's really built a rapport with Jenny Frizen. Yeah. She feels very comfortable talking to him. So I have a feeling that that's only, say, part two of... Because if, if you didn't know, he did a part one on comicbookinvest.com. It's a written article. It doesn't have video. But we are looking to bring the Cover Tunes interview segment to Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. So be on the lookout. You're going to see that more. Mike is a great guy. Um, I think he's very excited about joining the Simpleman's Comics family and putting his content out there. So he does a great job with these interviews. He is really an art aficionado. And I'm looking forward to kind of bringing you guys more of that content. 
If you haven't seen it, be sure to check that video out right, right on the channel. Um, it's a great interview. Right. And today, if you guys, I don't know if you saw it today or not, or on comicbookinvest.com in the latest Cover Tunes article, we had another interview that dropped on this channel, and it's with Clayton Crane. So it's another yes. great interview. Fantastic. Mike Morello does a great job of it. So definitely check those out as well. But with that being said, let's get into Cool Mike's Pick for the Week. Hey, everybody. Hope you had a great week. This is Mike Morello from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my hot pick for the week. And this week I'm going with Everything Venom. It seems like this character just doesn't die. Spec doesn't die on it. Uh, popularity of this character doesn't die. Doesn't seem to matter what it is, whether it's these old keys, um, obviously this thing, which is um, still doing unbelievable things on the market. It's, it's almost always on, um, you know, top seller lists. Um, this thing, which never seems to stay in a shop for more than a few minutes, um, even 298 and 299, which people I think are still a little confused over, um, these still go crazy. They still sell out, especially if they're in nice shape, if they're still nice and white. Um, and of course, everything that ties into it, um, including Carnage, of course, which is um, obviously where we're probably headed with the next film. But what I think is great about this is that no matter what, the film did, whether it was mediocre or not, this character has shown some real staying power. Um, it has survived through the movie, um, and it is clearly surviving, uh, probably due to Donny Cates' um, series going on right now. That thing sells out every week. The variants sell out. The regular covers sell out. The later printings sell out. It, when I go back into an LCS two or three days later, they're all gone every single time. Um, it doesn't seem to matter how many copies a, a shop orders either. They're just gone, um, which is crazy. Um, even the old variants that, that have always been hot are still selling well. Things like this. Um, one of my favorites, this one, which I think every Venom person should have. Um, th this stuff is just hot. I mean, I, ne I never see it on shelves. I never see it sit there for more than a few minutes. So um, my hot pick for the week is everything Venom, whether it's the modern series going on right now or all the old keys and everything in between, it is still hot. Thanks a lot, guys. So there we have it, Jack. Mike Morello giving us Venom this week. What do you think about this pick? I think at this point, Venom could be on the hot list every week. Um, Venom has become maybe Marvel's most popular character with collectors. Um, you know, there was a time Deadpool was everywhere and everybody was chasing Deadpool. But I talked to a lot of retailers at Heroes Con, and one thing was very consistent when it comes to the modern games, Venom and Carnage. Symbiote, really, I'll say, take it past Venom and say anything Symbiote, because things like Anti-Venom do well, and all of these first appearances. And people are looking for those um, first appearances of Scream and characters like that and She Venom. But the Donny Cates series... We've talked about it on the Civil Comics YouTube channel. We're, we're bullish on Kate at this point because Marvel's putting so much money, so much marketing behind him. He is their kind of golden goose right now. And I'm an advocate of buying uh, everything uh, Donny Cates from Marvel at this point. Fleet printings, like you said, those variants. Um, I think this absolute carnage story, I think people are, the wrong media is getting out there. Everyone's talking about this. 8 million copies joke, and I, I want to repeat that again, joke that Donny Cates told that everybody has taken massively serious. Um, by the way, that was a couple months ago that he told that joke, and just recently now, articles are starting to pick up on it. You're seeing speculators talk about it and say, don't buy Absolute Carnage for this reason. I would say don't buy Absolute Carnage, not because it's going to sell 8 million, because it has almost no chance of selling 8 million. Um, don't, you know, Absolute Carnage is going to be tough because of just the sheer amount of store variants that are going to be created for it. But why I'm excited for Absolute Carnage is it's going to be a great reading story. And the importance of reading those books is I think it could pop off other issues because Donny Cates ties everything together, which is why his books are so hot. Um, the way he brought Null and the Necro Sword and all of this in, tied things into Thor, old Jason Aaron run. Um, the way he brought things in from his previous stuff, the way we've seen him pop off all kinds of weird books, like when Doctor Strange 44 got hot. Um, you know, the, the guy knows how to weave these stories. And I'm a big believer that, like I said it on the previous pick, Dylan Brock was created for a reason. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe that those 
Venom number seven, it's a cameo. I like Venom nine better. Um, are doing are gonna, are doing well already, but they're going to do even better. I've been stockpiling those things. I put my money where my mouth is um, I, because it's it's a cover price book. I find it on shelves for cover, and when I can, I'm grabbing it. I don't think he created that character for no reason, especially being Eddie Brock's son. I also want to point out, if you saw the Venom movie, I know there's a lot of mixed uh, feelings on it. It wasn't the Venom we grew up with as 80s, 90s kids. But at the same point, it was an entertaining movie. It was one of those movies I enjoyed the second time more than I enjoyed the first time. But what I'm most excited for, and I don't feel like I'm spoiling anything for you if you haven't seen it by now. Sorry. Um, that post credit scene with Woody Harrelson. Woody Harrelson's the man. Woody Harrelson knocks out every performance he's in. And I have no doubt he's going to play the psychotic deranged killer of Cletus Cassidy the best you could imagine it being done and I think that carnage we're seeing that ASM 361 pop off uh is going to continue to become popular stealth by is 344 the first appearance of Cletus Cassidy because people are, are not picking that up they're not giving it it's just due and I think that that's a great book I also like that Mike pointed out ASM 298 and 299 for Eddie Brock those Venom cameos so slept on. I've been picking those up at value buys, buying VFs and near mints in that 20 to 40 range. Um, definitely undervalued when you compare it to what 300 goes for. ASF 300 is one of those not first appearance, first appearances where we give it the credit, and but it's really not a first appearance. Venom appeared like five times before that. But um, at the same point, I think that those books are undervalued in the market. I don't think we've seen Venom yet hit even the popularity he could hit because look at just this past week, we had Kevin Feige saying he wants to bring Venom in with Spider-Man and, and do something in the MCU. Can you imagine? You know, we're not, then we're not talking about a Sony movie. If we're bringing Venom into the MCU and he's fighting like Thor, anything could be possible. I saw, I saw something today where they're planning on seven more Tom Holland Spider-Man movies. Right, they're bullish on that. They're going hard, and and Tom Hardy just agreed to a new deal for more films. They they were kind of secretive on how many they're looking to do, and I think that's it done intentionally because they don't want you to know where Venom could pop up in the future. At the very least, we're definitely getting a Venom sequel, yeah. and um, yeah, I, I think Sony's got it between Venom, uh, Tom Holland Spider Man, and then the Into the Spider Verse movies. At Sony went from being kind of in trouble as a, a comic book movie franchise to being in a great position. And I think all this writing that Donny Cates is doing right now is just giving them material to create more future movies um, based off of. I would, and that's why, again, all of this spec, all of these first appearances that Donny Cates is bringing into the market are, are still, could still be even undervalued at this point because they could, who knows, they could be fast-tracked. Venom wasn't a character where his, we talk about world building where his world was really built out he it was really a bunch of different stories one writer would write him as a horror character another writer wrote him as agent venom and, and we had um you know uh, uh flash thompson as venom so there hasn't been any sort of consistency with venom and donny cage is really trying to round out the story and give us more context so i'm real bullish on a lot of these venom books and i think that uh, venom is here to stay uh that the anti-hero is here to stay for sure. Didn't we have a that '70s show Venom? So, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. It can't get worse than that. You know what I mean? It yeah. can't. So it's, we're only going up from here. Yeah. And yeah, and I don't fault Sam Raimi for that. I think yeah, Sam Raimi's no, one of the best movie directors, especially when it comes to horror movies. But uh, yeah, Spider Man Three was kind of rough. And so that was, was in a, a little bit of a different era of yeah. superhero movies. You know. At that point, that's what you were trying to do. Everything was big, everything was over the top, and everything was expensive and big name. And, you know, Topher Grace had a name at the time. But uh, Marvel has kind of shown the ability to go in a different route. When Robert Downey Jr. was hired for Iron Man, he was kind of at one of the lower points of his career. Um, yeah. they've, they've casted almost perfectly. And I, I think we're seeing that play out. I think Tom Hardy played Eddie Brock excellently. So, yeah, I love, um, yeah, I'll see any movie Tom Hardy's in. Right. So I, I'm, I'm down for more Venom movies. Was it perfect? No. But, I, I, you know, it was good enough to keep me interested for the second one. And that post credit scene had me ready for that sequel right off the bat. So there we have it. Mike Morello's pick, Venom. And we're going to roll right on to the last pick on the hot list this week. And it comes from Dollar Bin Digging author Peter Renna. 
What's going on everybody? So what's hot this week? For me, I have to say my hot pick this week would be Kendrick Lim. Uh, anybody saw the Hot 10 last week saw that his uh, Red Sony cover was right there on the list. And if you got them in the mail this week, you can agree. You can see why. But it's not just about this cover. Uh, another one went on sale this past weekend for his Vampirilla cover, which sold out pretty quickly. I forgot, missed out, so I did not get that one. And uh, he only has one other cover that I know of that uh, you might be able to grab, and that's a Battle Fairy and the Yeti. That was a Kickstarter book that uh, came out end of last year. I think the books came out, uh, were mailed out at the beginning of this year. And you can get his cover for a pledge of $25. I think it was from Counterpoint Comics or something like that. But uh, he's probably best known for being a game designer, and he has an art studio with uh, Art Germ. So you can kind of see that in his art style. It's very similar to Art Germ's, but it's kind of got a little bit of a Perillo vibe with a little bit of the sultriness. But uh, still has that same polish that uh, Art Germ has. So what I think is hot this week are Kendrick Lim. All right, thanks. So there we go, Jack. Peter's picking Kendrick Lim. This is one of those, this is one of those artists where... I knew what the cover was before I knew what the artist's name was because that Ratanya cover you've seen and some of the deviant art art some of the deviant art that Kendrick has. I've seen the art before, but I didn't know it was Kendrick Lim. I, and I liked it and I thought it was hot. But at first when Peter said Kendrick Lim, I thought he was leaving off the 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 Mar part of the Kendrick Lamar. But <laughs> <laughs> I love the art and that Red Sonya is hot. And some of those other art that, that he has just on deviant art that's actually not comic book covers, I really enjoy it. And then we were talking earlier, his Instagram page is full of great stuff. But what do you think about this pick? Right, and I'll say full disclosure, uh, Brian knows just before we started the show, my reaction was, who? Because I actually wasn't familiar with Kendrick Lip. Now again, like Brian said, I'm familiar with the art. I saw I saw the Red Sony cover. But um, I was not familiar with the name. Having done a deep dive on his Instagram, like Brian said, incredible. He's got so many incredible pieces. Um, I feel the art term comparison. What it really reminds me of is the way Michael Turner and Paul Green came up under, uh, or excuse me, J. Scott Campbell and Paul Green kind of came up under Michael Turner. And um, they kind of have that style. Don't want to disrespect the great Michael Turner like that. But uh, they came up under uh, Michael Turner and kind of had that um, style. And to this day, when you look at either of their art styles, a lot of that style gets attributed to J. Scott Campbell, but it's really, it kind of comes from Michael Turner. And I think you see that with Kendrick Lim because when I look at a lot of his pieces, it just screams art term. It's, it's, it looks a lot like the way he does kind of his, uh, his designs and his covers. That's not a bad thing. And we talked earlier with Shannon Mayer about some of the kind of boring financial guts of producing retailer exclusive variants. And I think this is a prime example. This kind of fits in there. You can copy and paste that. If I'm producing a retailer exclusive variant, um, my cost for getting art germ to do a cover is going to be probably several hundred into the thousands range. Um, my cost for getting Kendrick Lim, I'm going to guess is a lot lower to possibly provided for by the publisher. Because some of these lesser known artists, the publisher is actually willing to pay the rate. So oftentimes through CBSI, when we've produced variants, we have been more concerned with the control over the art design than per se who specifically the artist is going to be. And we feel like we've done great with Nate Gooden and Mauricio Villanreal, and um, they've done an excellent job. Um, so we haven't felt the need to go out and spend $2,000 on an Adam Hughes or somebody like that. Um, but that's what you're seeing is you're seeing these artists who kind of have that same style. They're able to create these knockout covers who maybe aren't going to cost retailers the same price, but they're resonating on the secondary markets. So definitely be on the lookout for Kendrick Lim covers because I think you can kind of see the same pattern as Shannon Mayer where after you have one hit, now people are checking for you. So be sure to hit his Instagram. Be sure to hit his Deviant Art page. Check out his style. If you, if you like it, make sure you're paying attention for that next Kendrick Lim release because I have no doubt it'll be hot. Right. And with that, that wraps up the hot list for this week. And we're going to roll right into the cold list right now, starting with Run the Table author Clint Jocelyn. Good morning, CBSI Nation. Clint Jocelyn coming to you with my cold pick of the week. And my cold pick of the week this week is... Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur variants, especially ratio variants. These were hot, hot books at one time, and they have cooled 
way, way down. A couple of things about these books. Number one, as we know, the print runs are very small in these books. Some of these have six, seven hundred more copies per ratio variant, and they are just have cooled down. Partially because I think that people are waiting for her to hit the market in terms of television and movies. But these books are cold, and I'm telling you, if you can pick them up now, it's a good long-term investment. I do think you're going to see her on the screen. I do think you're going to see an uptick in these books, but they are cold right now, and I would look to buy, especially like issue number three, issue number one. If you can find those at a reasonable price, I'm, I promise you they're going to just go up in value as soon as there's an announcement of her hitting some kind of other medium, meaning TV or television. So my whole pick of the week is Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur variants, but these, like anything else, everything's cyclical. They're going to come back around, and they're going to make you some money. Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur, especially variants. What do you think about it? I'm going to go ahead and give maybe an unpopular opinion, say uh, they're cold, and I think they should be. Uh, you and I have talked about this. I know you and I are on the same page with this one, but um, these books spiked because it wasn't on people's radar, and then it became kind of speculation buzz. I don't know how well Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur is truly resonating with readers. I don't know how well it's resonating with collectors. Um, we saw Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur be an intricate part of Marvel's advertising as a brand, say four years ago or so, three years ago. And recently with like the Marvel Comics 1000 advertisements, we haven't seen Moon Girl be kind of in that position. Um, we've seen a lot of these newer characters that have popped off, uh, you know, Miles Morales, Spider-Gwen, um, X-23 be featured front and center, but we haven't seen Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. And he talks about me other mediums. I think a movie is tough when predominantly it's a dinosaur. Um, so I think realistically, we may never see a Moon Girl Devil Dinosaur. I don't want to say never, but it's just, it's, it's long odds. And you're playing for a basically an animated uh, play, which limits you more. And a lot of these variants, they popped off because you're, again, playing in a smaller pond. So the, the books were scarce. If you were able to get some of these incentives and you couldn't find them, you were able to name your price. And I'm an advocate of playing in a small pond. But this is where I have to caution you. I'm an advocate of doing that with properties that have long-standing hardcore fan bases. So G.I. Joe and Transformers and things like that, you have 20, 30, 40 years of fandom built in. And it may be smaller than Wolverine and Thor, but it exists and it's real. And I don't know that we have really proven that Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur have that fan base. Shout out to Valiant Horton from CBSI, who has been the champion of everything Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur. Definitely the first guy on it. Definitely the first one putting all of us on it. But um, yeah, there was a time where I've made some Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur flips for sure. But honestly, I've sold all of my kind of key books, my, my, my number ones and things like that, because uh, there was a time when the getting was very good. And I'm not really surprised that it's kind of cooled off now. And I, again, we live in the age of the option. So I talk about this all the time. It may make me the speculation bad guy. I don't care. I'll take that. It's all about being made for film and TV when it comes to speculation. That's where you're going to make your money. I don't know. Marvel dinosaur movie? I don't know if they're getting that game. Yeah. Land of the Lost. Land of the, but yeah, I'm never, I'm not a fan. I'm the, this is me, Moon Girl. Never been a big fan. This could be the next AF fifteen and I wouldn't care because it's just it's just not in my wheelhouse. My buddy, he has we have a long standing joke that every time we go to the comic book store, he's a Moon Girl fan. He picks up and he keeps asking me, You gonna pick up Moon Girl? And I'm like, Nope. But <laughs> yeah, every time. Ask me if I'm picking it up. He knows the answer. Now he's just saying it to, to, to see what I say. But um definitely cold. And if people want to pick it up, the chance of them being able to flip it again in the future, it's probably there, but I'm leaving it on the shelf. And so if you're worried about me picking it up, you don't have to, but that's just my thoughts. And that's my opinion on that one title. I'm not, never big, not a big moon girl fan. And I'll leave it at that, but that was a great pick. And we're going to keep going right on 
into the next pick coming from Mr. Cool himself again, and that is Mike Morello. Hello once again, fine ladies and gentlemen. This is Mike Morello one more time from CBSI's Cover Tunes with my cold pick for the week, and it's a sneaky, sneaky hot pick in the cold pick. And the cold pick for me this week is the dreaded 9-6. For whatever reason, there is some stigma attached to these things. I don't really know why. Um, I've never really understood it, but there are definitely a large group of people out there who are like 9-8 or bust. If it's not a 9-8, I don't want it. It's got to be a 9-8. I am not in that camp. Not only am I perfectly happy with a 9-6 in my PC, um, but the, the potential in a 9-6, especially if it's an old slab like this one, if it's got an old label on it like this, it probably hasn't been pressed. So my advice is try to look in person, of course, and it's tough on eBay, but in person, when you're at cons and that kind of thing, take a look at the 9.6s on the wall. They're gonna be half the price of the 9.8s. And if you can tell that it can be pressed, if you're you know good, or honestly bring somebody along with you who does pressing um, or who knows how to grade a book uh, really well. And take a look and see if that thing's going to press out because there is absolutely the potential that a 9.6 will turn itself into a very, very pretty 9.8. And you've done it for a fraction of the price. And because grading is so subjective, this is what baffles me. You could submit a book, get a 9.8. Bring it home, crack it, resubmit it, get a 9.6. Crack it again, resubmit it, get a 9.4. Crack it again, resubmit it, get a 9.8. I don't know. So... Honestly, I think there's a lot of potential in this. I realize that people slab for investment purposes, um, and there are collectors who only want 9.8s. But I think there's a huge, huge, huge investment potential for you to go look at those 9.6s, see if they're pressable, see if you can get yourself a good deal on them, crack them, press them, resubmit them, get yourself some 9.8s. And that's my cold pick-ish for the week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Crack them. Crack them, Jack. Crack them. Hey, who we can, we all know, 9.8s are the Air Jordans and 9.6s are the LA gear of the world, right? But he has a good point. I have 9.6s in my collection. I'm not worried about cracking and trying to get a press to get a 9.8. Um, first appearance of He-Man and Skeletor, I got a 9.6 in that just because the price difference was so outrageous that I wasn't going to spend another $300 and I just got a 9.6 for a lot cheaper. Someday I might trade up, sell the 9.6, pick up a 9.8, but I don't see why sometimes that not, that two-tenths of a point is so drastic. We can make the arguments both ways, but I do like this pick, um, and he makes good points about cracking and re-slabbing, especially if you have someone that can grade or press, like he said. But what do you think about this one, Jack? I like it. Um, as far as cracking and re-slabbing, I think it comes down to why did it get a 9.6? If it got a 9.6 because of some obvious crease, that can be that can be fixed through uh, pressing, absolutely. But the dangerous thing is what Mike said, is the subjectivity of grading. Because absolutely, I've seen 9.8s that look terrible, and I've seen 9.6s that I can't find anything wrong with. So um, that's, that's a game where you can make some money, but it's also a dangerous game, so you have to watch out with that. What I like is what he talked. What you talked about with, about PC. Um, you got to ask yourself, man, why are you buying this book for yourself? If you're buying it for an investment, if you're really an investment, it's not truly for your PC, and that's what you have to realize. If you're worried about the value, then you know it's more of an investment than anything else. Um, if I'm buying for my PC, I have no issue with a nine six because a nine six is a near mint book. You have to ask yourself, well, how much better does anything need to be than that? Uh, if you have a collection full of nine sixes, you have a collection full of beautiful books. Um, and the reality is that it's very similar to what happened in baseball cards. I don't know how many of you all out there in Sibelman's comics family are familiar with the graded baseball card game. It predates comics and it's a really good precursor to see what the market happens in the market. Because basically anything that's happened with baseball cards has also happened in comics. And PSA, the big grading company, and back day, these nines that they would put out have basically become worthless because, and if you think the price difference is bad in comics, oh my God, you will see a, a card go for $12 and a nine that's hundreds in a 10. And that difference, it just, 
I can't physically with my eyes see that difference. So if I'm collecting for myself, I have no problem with a mint uh, Charles Barkley rookie card at a nine and far cheaper than that 10 that I'll probably never go to for. Yeah. And, and I feel the same way as comics. And I felt what you said about that Skeletor and He-Man because, you know, that's a book I want for myself. I don't need a nine because if I had a nine eight and a movie got made, I'd be tempted. I'd have a hard time. And I feel like those nine sixes, they allow me to enjoy the books and not feel that. Now, if you're buying variants and things like that, obviously, you know, that's a little different. But for PC books, I, I'm not as picky about that creep. And I actually will advocate to you guys, take a hard look at your collection and ask yourself why you're buying books. Uh, scale down the books that you're buying just for investments and put those separately. And when you keep your PC tight and then look at your PC and say to yourself, what do I want? And uh, do I have to chase that 9-8? Because I actually think if you're just buying it for yourself, you're not buying it for a sale, um, you, you don't need to impress yourself. So get that book that you're going to be able to get for that best value. And I'll go so far as to say, um, Brian and I are both fans of uh, Gary Vee. If you're a big Gary Vee guy on social media, check out Gary Vee. Um, he's a uh, social media influencer. He runs a huge social media marketing company. Um, and he's a big baseball card guy. He, for his personal collection, that's something he's an advocate of. He's buying nines because he thinks if they're so undervalued, they're going to come back. Now, I don't know if I'm that bullish on nine sixes, but I do think that there is a possible market correction that could happen one day, at least on some of these books where nine eights are tough. Um, because nine sixes are just so valued less than nine eights. And like Brian said, that, that point two difference just isn't enough to validate some of these four and five time uh, multipliers. So I like nine sixes. I may be in the minority here. It's another thing though that I would love to hear you guys sound off in the comment section. And I mean, I'll, you can sit there and look at this and argue from a bunch of different ways. But if you're looking at just the new releases, modern market, if you're submitting for grading and, <coughs> and it comes back a nine six, it is almost considered the kiss of death to you. <clears throat> so there is that good point for why it's on the cold list there. And it's why people make a, people have a business of guaranteeing nine eights because people want that nine eights. Like the Bolo show, we have that the sponsor of the Bolo show and Nick at Slapped Heroes. He sells nine eight copies and there's some books that I'm like, hey, it might be PC still, but I want a nine eight in it. So I go and buy the guaranteed nine eight because you don't want to risk getting a nine six in that modern comic. So it all depends on what books you're looking at, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's far different with those moderns. Um, and it's just basically because it's easier to get a nine eight in modern. That's really all it is. So you're so you know, there's nothing that kills you more than submitting a, a group of books to CGC and getting back a handful of nine yeah. sixes. That went from you the know. shelf to a bag and board to the mail to the grader to come back and be a nine exactly. six. And exactly. And a guy like Nick was slapped. Heroes. He works his butt off. Um, you know, he's pressing. He's he's got him in a humidor. He's you know he's doing everything he can do to get those nine eights to you. I respect guys for how hard they work to do that. That's not an easy game. Um, so absolutely, if you want those nine eights, I I think it is worth paying that extra bit for. And if you're buying moderns, yes, that's a different story. But if you're buying books for your collection, like we talked about, if you're buying those ASM 361 or you want that ASM 344, you look at that 9.8 price, you look at the 9.6 price, there's just such a vast difference. So it all just depends on what you're looking for. But I agree, modern 9.6s are the kiss of death. Um, it, it almost becomes worthless to slab. It, they're tough to sell, too. So that was a great pick from Mike, and we're going to go right into the coldest with our next pick. I don't know if it's Topher, Mass Speculator, or if it's FOMO. But we're going to find out right now. What's up, everybody? This is FOMO the Puppet here with your cold pick for the week. Donny Gates may be one of the hottest creators in comics, but even his work isn't immune to speculative insanity. Right now, God Country is cold. Near mid sets are selling around 60, and issue one 9.8 is around 100. That's low, real low. I'd buy and hold if all my money wasn't tied up invested in Puppet Town. I've also got a loan shark on my tail, thanks to my idiot brother. But that's a story for another day. See you next week. So, Jack, God Country, 
came out, it was hot for a while, cooled back down again, then there was word again of movie being written. Um, so then it heated back up again, it seems to be kind of declining, but what do you think about this pick, Jack? Okay, I like this pick. It is cold at the moment. It, this is where, guys, Simpleman's Comics family, come on, bring it in here because we really want to huddle up with you and let you know how to read this list. That's what you need to know because, yeah, it's cold. Don't shy away from it. Run to it because the reality is this movie is coming from legendary pictures. They, they want Donny Cates to write this movie. They feel like he's the guy who's going to bring it to the big screen. So now you know how busy Don Cates is. Clearly you see how many books he has on the shelf. He's working on the movie. He's working with producers. Um, but th this is a big world that they're building. If you're familiar with God Country, um, this, is, this is a big thing. So this is going to be a process. It's going to take some time. But Legendary Pictures put a substantial investment in this. And we talk about it. Follow the money. Donny Cates is not going to take time out of this schedule to work on this movie if it's not something that's going to come to fruition. And speculation people just again they just they they don't have the patience they're not going to wait it out so so many people are jumping off and selling these sets for 60 dollars as tofer excuse me fomo pointed out um and i remember a couple of years ago when i was buying sets for 60 and selling them for 150 so this gives you kind of a, a opportunity right now it's definitely a buy and hold you're not going to make any kind of a flip $100 9.8s are, are too low for this book. Um, $60 sets are too low. Um, I think it's a great buy. It's a great back issue buy right now. Um, there's so many of these image books popping off that you kind of get overwhelmed with it. And God Country is more of a quiet stealth buy right now. But it, if you follow Donny Cates on Twitter, he probably tweets once every couple weeks about the progress going on with God Country. So... It's definitely still coming, and um, it's only a matter of time. He's recently talked about casting on Twitter, who he would love to see. And uh, he wasn't so much offering who he would love to see, but fans were offering who they'd love to see, and he was commenting on it. So I think it's a great buy. And it is the point of the cold part of this show is to really highlight not just what isn't selling well, but what buying opportunities exist in the market. And that's why I love this content, because there's not a lot of content out there right now on YouTube or anywhere else on the internet within the comics community that's directly giving you opportunity to buy. If we're just simply telling you what's hot, you missed your mark. Um, the hot 10 list is awesome. It's a fun piece of information. But where I think a lot of people miss the mark is there's not a lot of buying opportunity with books that are already scorching hot on the market. If you're buying at that point, you're doing it wrong. Don't run out and buy a hot 10 book. Pull a hot 10 book out of your back issue bin and flip it. Absolutely. But these cold list books, a lot of these, they're buying opportunities. And if you believe in an item, like if you see this list and you're like, God country, that shouldn't be on the cold list. That book's awesome. Well, exactly. But it is cold, but it is awesome. So I definitely advocate buying God Country. I'm definitely a uh, Donnie advocates. If you've uh, ever been on Twitter and seen his uh, his cult or his crew, the, the advocates, I'm definitely a Donnie advocate. Um, I, I think that he is the man in comics right now. So I have no doubt that he'll be able to pull this movie off. I think he's the right man for a job. And I know somebody may say, well, yeah, yeah, but he's not a movie writer. I actually think that these movie companies would get a lot more of these movies made if they would lean more on the comic book writers who actually created the stories rather than taking these worlds that these comic creators spent their life writing and then sticking them in the hands of script writers who are going to change them to fit some movie narrative that doesn't necessarily jive with the comic. I think it's what's best for speculation. It may take a little longer, but patience is a virtue, and I think it's going to pay off in your wallet. So, yes. Like we always advocate, we like the cold list better because there's always buying opportunities there. And speaking of movie option news, the next pick is another book that got hot with movie option. And this pick comes from Dollar Ben Digging author, Peter Renna. So my cold pick for this week is something that I do not understand why it is still cold. And that would be Old Guard. Uh, with everybody jumping on everything under the sun that's getting option, I'm not sure why a book that's actually in production and has an all-star cast and it's going to be on Netflix, is not seeing more heat. I mean, Charlize Theron, they just signed uh, Chiwetel Ejiofor to be in it, and these books just aren't moving. Uh, there's 
like 60 of them listed. You can get the regular cover for like 10 to 12 bucks. Even the foil, which is a one per store uh, that came out a, a while back, is one just sold for $15. Like, I don't know what needs to happen to get these things to heat up, but uh, maybe as we get closer, maybe see that first trailer. But for now, they're still cold, but I don't know why. So it might be a good opportunity to jump on it before uh, it's too late. All right, thanks. I really love this pick because he makes a good point. In production, all-star cast, but I also think this is running that same parallel. Before Umbrella Academy actually hit Netflix, it didn't do much, right? And then once it hit Netflix, it just freaking took off for a while. I think this is going to follow that same path. What do you think about this pick? Absolutely. I sit here and I go, Peter, shh, don't, don't, don't tell everybody. But again, that's why this show is awesome because we're out here telling you. We're telling you what's going on and what we're buying. And I'm going to tell you factually, I've bought Oak Garden over the last couple months. But I'll, I'll even give you a little more transparency because we're all about transparency here. I'm not trying to hide anything from you. I like to put my money where my mouth is. Um, I'm buying that Go Thank You Very Much, that one per store because – we you're talking about a book that's one per store versus a book that was ordered out however many you want. But the price difference on these books on eBay, it's only a few dollars. That's all you're seeing. Um, and that, to me, is massively undervalued. I agree the cast is huge. But, Brian, you know, I talked about this, man. You know where I sit with Netflix. Netflix is king. Every person owns Netflix. Everybody has it. So you get accessibility with Netflix that you don't get with HBO that you're not gonna get with some cable channel. Think about how many cord cutters there are. Think about how many people aren't spending that money on premium channel movies. Think about when you've got a movie, the cost of going to the movie theater. And think about how many movies get released in a year. So all you have to do is look at what like Bird Box did um, and, and sit there and go, well, a movie like Bird Box, a show like Umbrella Academy, look at the, the, the way these movies have be, and TV shows have become part of now pop culture lore. Everybody watches Netflix. I just saw a statistic about um, Adam Sandler's new movie with Jennifer Aniston, a movie I, I sat and watched with my girlfriend. Um, fun movie, but it's, it's not Adam Sandler at his best. Um, but it did 30 million views in its first weekend. Yeah, they said it like broke a box office, and I, I didn't understand that because... I watched the movie and uh, same opinion. Enjoyed it. It was good. Mm -hmm. Not classic Adam Sandler that I'm used to, but pair that with Jennifer Aniston and it was it was enjoyable. It's one that the family could watch almost. Right. But it's just one of those things where when something new comes on Netflix, we're so accustomed to turning our Netflix on every day that when something new comes on, we're like, well, it's, it's the new big thing. I got to watch it. I got to at least check it out. And it, it doesn't cost you anything because you're already paying your Netflix subscription. So you're more willing to try out new shows. I've watched so many shows on Netflix that I never, never would have checked out. I'm watching a show now with my friend called Trinkets about three girls in a shoplifting ring. Never would have been a show that I would have watched. But I'll tell you what, I'll be honest with you, I kind of love it. Um, and it, you will only take those chances with a $12 streaming service that you're already paying for. So if... If we look at a, uh, something like Old Guard, if Old Guard did anywhere near 30 million streams in a weekend, how many of those people would then say, oh, I have to own that comic book? Now, I know it's a small percentage, but how many of this book exist? You know, you're talking, you know, 30,000, 40,000. I really don't know. It could be way less than that. Um, but a small number, it wouldn't take much for this book to pop and become a fifty hundred dollar book. And that's why I'm a big advocate of that one per store thank you variant with the gold lettering. It's a little tough to find. And I'll tell you, I actually found one in a back issue bin where the dealer didn't realize that it was that one per store. And this is like months after the book's released because it's kind of it's kind of stealth with that gold lettering. So be on the lookout for that. I think this is a great pick. Um, I'm bullish on anything Netflix is doing. That accessibility, accessibility is huge. The easier it is for you to watch something, the more the value of it is. That's why I know there's a lot of talk. I'm going to change it, the subject a little bit to the boys. There's a lot of talk about the boys. We see the boys on the hot list. I'd be careful. And the reason I'd be careful is because everybody can see the trailer, which is popping the book off because everybody has YouTube, but not everybody has Amazon Prime. And Amazon shows haven't seemed to make the mark on the comics market. So I'm less bullish about that. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. Do I think The Boys is going to be dope? Yeah, I do. I can't wait to watch it. But um, 
I feel a lot more sound about anything than Netflix options than anything else. And that's why we talk about it on the Bolo Show. We always say you're one Netflix option away from getting rich with a book. And um, I, I Old Guard has a great chance. And the only reason it's cold is the same reasons that we talked about with um, with God Country. It's just it's in development, so it's it's not talked about as much. You're a trailer away from seeing massive spikes. That's all. Yeah, and and kudos to Peter. And I wonder if he took if that was all one take or if he did it multiple times. But he he announced that actor's name with like no problem whatsoever, and I would have sat there and. Ch and yeah, I'm gonna never pronounce it correctly. I'm not gonna try right now. <laughs> and that's a is that out of BC he's talking about? <laughs> I forget. I think that's a. I, think that's a yeah, was, I have no idea. Or is that the guy from Red Belt? I can't tell. Yeah, but and you mentioned the boys. I mean, you never know. That could be Amazon's Iron Man. You know that kicked off the MCU with the whole. Robert Kirkman stuff that's coming that's got the exclusive deal with Amazon, but you made good points. But I mean, that's what speculation is, right? And it's got right, what I mean, Carl Urban in it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, if you ever watched Powers on yeah. the PlayStation Network, Powers was a great TV show <laughs> yeah. from Brian Michael Bendis. But who was watching the PlayStation Network? Yeah. And that's what it comes down to: is while Amazon's bigger for sure, Amazon's not in. It's not everyone's number one streaming service. You're fighting for those streaming dollars. We've got Netflix. We've got Hulu. Disney we've Plus is coming. Disney Plus. DCU. We've got... Um, DCU ain't hurt no one, though. No, no. But it's just the bottom line is yeah. I've looked at this myself. Once you start looking at your cable bill yeah. and you start looking at all of your various streaming services, you got to make cuts somewhere. Yeah. Very few of us can afford to just have everything. But then and, I gotta um, cut Prime because most people like me, I buy Prime for the shipping more than, and the video is just an added bonus. Without a doubt, without a doubt. But I don't know about you, but I've had Prime for a long time. I almost forget about the Amazon Prime because, to be honest with you, Amazon Prime as a streaming service has been kind of lackluster. They haven't had the same, so it's not my first place I check for things. Yeah, there's so, a handful of shows that I love on Prime. If they could put a new season of Jack Ryan out, that would be great. But um, right, John Sneak Krasinski's the man. Yeah, Sneaky Pete. Um, Bosch, what's the the one with Bob, uh, Billy Bob Thornton where he's the lawyer, the drunk, the, the drunk, yeah, the drunk I don't lawyer? Really yeah. So there, there's some good shows, but I, I recognize and I agree with the point you're making that it's not the the heavy contender that Netflix is. You're not going to get 30 million streams in a weekend. You you can't you cannot do that from anywhere but Netflix. Yep. Maybe the Disney Plus will be able to hit those kinds of numbers. But yeah, and I'll be interested to see. Especially with um, the Star Wars series, John Favreau uh, directed, right? Mm -hmm. And if it kicks off any of the Star Wars books, but was yeah, Mandalorian? I Mandalorian. I would look for a lot of those Jango Fett, Boba Fett type um, type Dark Horse books. Um, those Dark Horse books are dirt cheap, and a lot of those early kind of Fett stories, I think, have a good chance of taking off once the Mandalorian hits. Right. So that was Peter's pick, and that's going to actually wrap up the hot and cold list this week. We're going to bring it up on the screen right now. So there's some trends that I see here. Um, the hot list, artists, there's some hot artists as a trend. And then you see like that Venomverse, that Donny Cates Venomverse, right? Right. right. And Donny Cates is actually all over this list between Venom, between uh, Null, and then God Country being on the cold list. But as I said, that's a hell of a buy right now. Um, that's all over this list. But you're right. There's definitely some trends starting starting to pick up. And all you have to do, I, I we talked about it, I was at Heroes Con. Be on a convention floor right now. And you're seeing you're seeing a lot of those trends. You're seeing that. Um, to kind of harken back to last week's list, we talked about horror books. The most popular book at Heroes Con was uh, House of Secrets 92. Everybody wanted that first Swamp Thing. They didn't care. Honestly, they didn't care that Swamp Thing got canceled. Because Swamp Thing's been such a good show, people have faith. And we talked about the fact that it got canceled because of a tax credit in North Carolina. It's really just a, a financial thing. It's not The show's been awesome. So um, I, I think that oh, this, this show, the Hot and Cold show, has really pointed out a lot of these trends. And I saw it kind of uh, firsthand on the convention floor. That and the fact that indie comics are killing it. Indie comics are really... Um, 
just in general, whether it's image, whether it's boom, whether it's IDW, they're really making a mark on the hobby right now. Right. So there it is, guys. That's the hot and cold list for this week. Just remember, always exclusive Wednesday nights, 9 p.m. during the premiere of this video. Also, tomorrow night we are back with the CBSI Bolo Show, correct, Jack? Absolutely. And I'm excited about this week. This is a week I've been waiting for for three months. And I'm going to go ahead and give you a spoiler. There's two long-term plays of the week this week. Yes. A lot of great books coming out this week. So we're going to go over those Thursday night, 9 p.m., right here on Superman's Comics. Jack, anything else you want to say before we let him go? I want to thank everybody who joined us in the live chat tonight. We are sorry we could not be here to join you. This community is awesome, and you guys kill it in the chat, and it's amazing that you guys can kill it even without us here. And the only reason why we're not here is because we're filming an interview right now, right while you're watching this, with Arun Singh again from Boom Studios, and I can't wait to drop those bolos on you guys. Get ready. Right. One thing, I'll give you a quick bolo spoiler that Arun told me today in DMs. Today, he announced a new WWE story that he has. So that be on the lookout for that. And that interview, he came to us. He came to us before San Diego Comic-Con because we were looking to have him on after. So we can't wait right. to see what information he's going to put out. And that will be on the channel. We'll let you know as soon as we can when that video will premiere. Great interview. Last time he came on and killed it. Such a great comp. He's passionate about comics. He's a collector at heart and a VP of marketing at Boom. So great guy as well. Anything else, Jack? Oh, just just like you said, stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, stay tuned again on the Silverman's Comics YouTube channel. We got some fun announcements coming up. Um, I'll say some exclusive announcements coming up very soon from the world of independent comics. All right. And with that being said, we will see you right here live tomorrow night, 9 p.m. for the CBSI Bolo Show. See you then, guys.